Yeah, Alan. Excellent job. Alan's doing tech support right this second. He'll be with us in a moment, Carol. So I um, also want to point out um, the beautiful uh, opportunity table that uh, Bob Hamilton and John Lilly brought in. Um, so and donated. So thank you for that. Um, Yay. Amazing, amazing tech table. Uh, I took some pictures so that we can share them. Uh, there are some requests to take pictures of what's in the room and share them with us. We'll do that later. Um, and then there's some uh, nice plants in the plant table. Uh, we're missing Bill Weaver so far. So usually we don't have Bill Weaver sized plants, but we have some other nice plants. So, <laughs> uh, so for announcements, Alan, do you want to pick it up? or? Sure, I'll go through. Good evening, everyone. How's this? Um, all right, the first announcement. We have three new members we'd like to welcome. Uh, Daniel Miller Brunker, Martha Shumway, oh, I guess four, and Thomas Price and Carol Martin. So welcome if you're here. AOS judging going on. There's some, of course, here right now, and there will be more of oh, these gates are old. Um, I think they're still true. There'll be some at Filoli coming up on a Saturday morning, and uh, the California Sierra Nevada Judging Center has some at uh, in Lincoln, California, and um, the Sacramento Orchid Society um, at their monthly meeting, which is probably coming up. Um, it's tomorrow, so that, that still works. Oh, no, today. Today. Well, you're probably not there right now. For more information, you can contact Lynn, and she'll tell you what I got wrong. Uh, I thought so. Um, upcoming events, the Carmel Orchid Society will be meeting this Saturday uh, at Tanya Lamb's Greenhouse in San Jose. And then also on Saturday, the Bay Area Plurothalic Alliance will be meeting at Jeff's house. So if you're interested in either of those, feel free to look them up. Then we have a lot of things coming up. Um, next Monday, we have a combination board meeting and Orchids in the Park show committee meeting. Um, it's Monday at 7 p.m. Zoom, same link as this one, so you know how to get in. Um, we're hoping that everyone will take time to volunteer at Orchids in the Park. Um, there's lots to do, a lot of it's fun. So please sign up. Um, we're about to start doing pre-orders. Um, you can check it out on the website. That's always a nice way to get your shopping done early. Uh, that'll be starting with the 15th here. Um, if you have plants you want to sell, you can contact Jeff and get you on the system. We're also going to have some Orchiata Mark, um, some artwork, some other fun stuff for sale. Um, last time there was demand for bark, so we have heard and we have answered. Um, and the next month's speaker is going to be Peter T. Lin of Diamond Orchids. He'll be live and in person here in the room. Um, he's going to do an opportunity table, but he is also doing pre-orders. So if you want to take a look at his website, there's a discount and he will bring it here with him. And of course, right after that is Orchids in the Park which I've always been talking about, and hopefully you are excited and sick of hearing about. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's right here in the room. And uh, come on out after you volunteer. Actually, it's in the other room. Yeah. Well, it's in the other room, okay. But it's the same building, you know how to get here. Um, <coughs> last time and in the uh, newsletter, you should have read about the uh, quest to preserve the Dracula Reserve down in Ecuador. Um, there is an interesting gold mining around this very unique preserve. Um, it's got a lot of diversity, both in uh, unique plants and unique animals. Um, so the, <clears throat> I'm going to get this right, the um, Orchid Conservation Alliance is trying to build, to buy land that's right around it in order to preserve it so that gold miners can't get it and strip mine it, as you can see here in these photos. Um, 
So they're trying to raise $100,000 in order to purchase this, these two pieces of property, uh, or the first piece, big piece of property. Um, and the San Francisco Orchid Society is trying to help. We are hoping to raise over $10,000 of that on our own. Um, there's a couple different ways you can get involved if you'd like. Um, for one, you can just go straight to their website, which you can see there, orchidconservationalliance.org slash donate. And you say that you're donating for the land reserve. And then you mentioned that you were donating through us in the little notes column. And we will be matching donations up to $5,000. We are also trying to collect donations at Orchids in the Park. And if you are offering plant sales at Orchids in the Park, you can donate those sales to the app. Um, if you do that, then the little percentage that we get for handling it all will also go into that pot. Uh, since the board met last month and decided to do this, uh, the board members have already thrown in the first two and a half thousand dollars to get there. Uh, so we are very close, honestly, as we're just getting started. Um, I feel very confident that by the end of the month, end of Orchids in the Park, we will have raised at least that total $10,000 to be able to help save this property. So please give what you can. Um, can I trade you? And now we're ready to get started with Bob Hamilton. I'll pass it over to Jeff. All right. Is Bob going to do the, did you send you the mic, the hand mic or the yeah. All right. So we have we have a uh, Bob's history here. I don't know how long it's going to be. Maybe it's kind of a stranger to the society. I'm going to do this. Uh, for those who don't know Bob, uh, he's a second generation Berkeley native who gave up. Hey, just a sec. Of the, of the two mics, uh, yours is the worst. The other one was actually pretty good. So I can hardly uh, understand you. Uh, let me try it again. Uh, so Bob is a, a second generation Berkeley native who gave up studies in physics to pursue a career as a Please scientist. use the other mic. Glass globes specializing in fabrication of electrical experimental electron tubes, lasers, sockets, <clears throat> and eventually uh, becoming the use of Berkeley principal scientific glass globe. His interest in orchids began in 76 when he and his partner John Brothers, who is also with us tonight, purchased a home at a solarium, which they filled with plants, including orchids. Since then, Bob has specialized in organic blossoms and their genetics, and Bob and John have trekked forests of Mexico, Central America, and the Andes. During one such trek, they discovered Purifala CDI. Uh, Jeff, can you please use your the other microphone? It's the same microphone. It's just me versus Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be done in a second. We'll be hearing Bob on the other mic. Um, he's the recipient of the American Work Society's 2015 Presence Award, granted to an individual who's made an outstanding contribution to the ARS. He's here tonight to talk about the Orchid craze, its origin and future, explorations and discoveries in the 19th century, dramatically shifted human consciousness from beliefs based mostly on faith to objective based understandings. Exciting revelations to galvanize society. The talk attempts to encapsulate and share some of these ideas, including 19th century science that resulted in the Victorian and subsequent record. So, with that, I'll stop bothering people and let Bob talk. <laughs> Uh, I have a fairly loud voice, so if I want to, I can just talk. Well, then they won't they be able to hear. hear. Oh, do you want to just use that? All right. I'm sorry. Or we could try. You know that that has even more of an echo, right? Yeah. You're pretty clear. All right. Uh, you don't have to see me, so I, is this on? You got to talk to me. I'm turn it on. I have to turn it on. That might be an idea. I'll text all of them. At any rate, it's been uh, 
45 years, or about 45 years since I first came to the San Francisco Orchid Society meeting. Um, uh, or I could give you an equivalent about 45 pounds ago, but I came to a San Francisco Orchid Society meeting with my partner, John Meadows. Um, at that time, uh, this room probably would have had somewhere between 180 and 200 people. So when we talk about an orchid craze, there was definitely an orchid craze when I joined this society. Uh, but the talk I'm going to give tonight is actually about an even greater orchid craze, which is in the 19th century. But in order to understand that orchid craze, you have to at least have some understanding of the 19th century and what a dynamic century it was in the uh, what motivated me to actually make this talk was uh, Andrea Wirth's book, Wirth's book on uh, Von Humboldt, who uh, really is credited with the invention of nature. So up until the early uh, 1800s, basically the Nicene Creed, a uh, religious creed that said we put everything on faith. We didn't challenge faith through science. We didn't challenge faith through philosophy. We just accepted things on my scene three. Um, guys, I hate to interrupt, but if you could be closer to the owl because we can't hear a damn thing. Okay. I'm assuming I'm assuming you're not using the little uh, 7-Eleven cup microphone because we can't. I can closer it'll get more resonance. That's what you want. No, you need to be closer to the microphone that's in the uh, uh, owl because we're not hearing anything here. How about that? Is that better? Yeah, that's way better. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look you in the face. Yep. Uh, I'll go begin. Uh, go. Okay. Oh, we're going to go too fast there. No. Okay, so uh, I'm going to begin in, in, in South America, and I'm going to begin with uh, what South America represented to uh, Europe at the beginning of, uh, at the end of, of the 18th century. And that was, it was a, a place to uh, uh, pillage and take resources from um, for profit. Uh, and that changed, and that changed very quickly uh, when a man named Juan Humboldt, who was born in uh, 1759, self-funded the exploration of South America and uh, uh, brought us essentially the concept of, of nature from a scientific uh, viewpoint. Let's go to the next one. Now, um, the first thing I'm going to show is, I hope we can show, there we go. This is a flyover that NASA did of the Andes. So since I'm talking about South America, it's important to understand the Andes, which are the longest mountain range in the world. We're not seeing, we're not seeing your slides. We're seeing the, uh, the, 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 the intro slide. I'm not seeing your slide. Well, I can't uh, promise you, you ever will. <laughs> there we go. At any rate, uh, this is the longest mountain range in the world, and it's one of the youngest mountain ranges in the world. And as you fly over and you start in Chile, you see a lot of cloud cover and you see also a lot of snow. But as you move north, uh, you see uh, a more varied uh, Andes. And you also see these highly pocketed areas of the Andes, which is where a great deal of speciation occurs. Things that grow in each one of these little valleys seldom escape those valleys. Uh, we're looking at Lake Titicaca right now, which is on the border of Peru, Bolivia. And then eventually we'll head up uh, further to where Machu Picchu is. Uh, and then Ecuador and finally to Colombia, where the Andes branches into three different ranges. So, um, but I just wanted to give you an overview of the geography and how specialized the orchids are from the Andes. So we're coming up on, on Ecuador now, uh, probably the highest diversity of orchids anywhere in the world. And finally, the mountain, the Andes split into three ranges up in Colombia. All right. Um, so, I have this picture that was done by Frederick Church. It's in the New uh, 
Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, and it shows kind of the ideal landscape that people in the United States and Europe would be uh, shown and introduced to in the form of paintings. I mean, we're talking about a period prior to photography. And uh, just to show you uh, how realistic this is, um, this, this is a photograph of a very similar area in Ecuador. So it gives you uh, an idea of uh, how idyllic these geographies were and how exciting they were. So here's Von Humboldt, and he's with his friend Bonquan, and the two of them uh, trekked throughout uh, the Andes, particularly Ecuador, discovering a lot of orchid species, which were later uh, uh, classified by a man in Germany named Kunt. And uh, uh, they uh, actually defined the genus of the Don Rossling, which is the genus I'm most interested in. Um, von Humboldt was a rich man, and he self-funded his explorations. Uh, he was in the Caribbean, he was in Central America. He even visited with Thomas Jefferson in the United States, and Hamilton in the United States. So he was a very uh, uh, sophisticated, broad-minded person. Right. Uh, he gave us uh, a, a lot of descriptions, uh, one of which are, are, are the concept of isotherms, and that is that if you take a specific elevation around the globe, you find similar plants growing. Um, and so this is a, a, an illustration he did for uh, a self-published book that's showing isotherms um, and, and the vegetation and foliage. Uh, you find uh, along those belts. So the 19th century, um, I made a list of some of the discoveries, some of the inventions, and some of the things that were actually introduced in the 19th century. Um, I won't go on this slide too long. I did highlight nature, and I highlighted science, and that is to say modern science. Um, there's such a long list here, I will include a lot of these things as, as uh, slides. Uh, I will have some slides about things that occurred in the 19th century, but things such as the light pole, the sewing machine, um, phonograph, photography, I don't have slides that represent those things, but I do want to point out this was a very dynamic century. And probably the greatest change that occurred in the 19th century was um, work went from muscle to machine. So prior to the 19th century, almost all work was done with muscle, but it was animal or human muscle. And toward the end of the 19th century, virtually all significant work was done by steam engines or internal combustion engines or electric drives. Okay. Um, I don't think it's worth reading through this completely, but once again, the 19th century was really the invention of modern science. Um, following the Crusades, uh, there was a, a enlightened period in Europe that was uh, brought back from the Middle East from the, from the uh, Muslims and introduced into Europe and began the quest uh, for science and investigation of mathematics and science. Uh, but it really culminated in a formalization of science in uh, the 19th century. Uh, I have a little quote at the top that might be worth reading, uh, which comes from uh, Thomas Huxley. Um, I believe the greatest intellectual revolution in mankind we've seen is now slowly taking place by the agency of science. Um, this is a slide of Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was a self-taught self electrician uh, and who studied electricity, a scientist. And uh, he began uh, Christmas lectures, I think it's about the 1830s, uh, specifically aimed at children and training and educating children about science. Um, and so this is one of his lectures presented, I think this was his Christmas lecture. Uh, unfortunately, the title is obscure. Um, at any rate, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, two dogs in. Yes. Okay. Uh, in the United States, there was a similar uh, movement of lectures 
uh, some of it by charlatans and some of it by scientists. It's called the Lyceum Movement. And so these were public lectures. Remember, no radio, no television. So this was the public exposure to new information, science. All right. Okay, so what were some of the really uh, pivotal introductions in the 19th century? Uh, one was transportation. Uh, people, uh, most people did not travel very far from the village they were born in. Um, so we have the, uh, the uh, steam locomotive in the early part of the 19th century and the railroads, uh, mostly in England. It began in England. Um, and then um, the next one. Another important uh, invention was communication with the telegraph. Um, the English were using the telegraph system uh, to actually coordinate their railroads, which is why I put the slide in the telegraph after the railroad. Um, and then they collaborated with the Americans, Samuel Morse, who was the Morse Code, um, and later on uh, Edison, who had some improvements made in telegraphy. But at any rate, we began here in England in the early part of the 19th century. Okay. And of course, there was the uh, laying of the transatlantic cable, so communication across the Atlantic. Um, this is uh, some photographs of the uh, commissioning of the transatlantic cable. Uh, another invention of the 19th century was sheet glass. Uh, prior to uh, the 19th century, glass was created by hand, a bob of glass was drawn and was spun around until the centrifuge was thrown out. It was a very expensive product, and it was such a luxury in the 19th century that both England and Europe had a, a glass tax that was based on the number of windows you had in your house. Why is this important to orchids? Well, um, a man named Paxton designed some of the early greenhouses and to get the structural information he needed, to get the ratios for the support of uh, glazing of greenhouses, he actually studied and, and characterized the underside of the Amazon lily, which gave him uh, a, a good starting point for being able to create structures of a greenhouse. And uh, this is uh, Lord Rolls' greenhouse. It was designed by Paxton. Uh, this was one of the first uh, Greenhouses in Europe, glass houses in Europe. Um, and uh, Lord Roll is well known for actually um, an orchid that's named after his, uh, his estate, the estate of Bicton, Ringo Stelly, Victoriens. In the 19th century, uh, was really one of the first industrial expositions. Uh, there had been world fairs in other parts of Europe, but uh, this was actually an exhibition put on in England uh, to highlight and, uh, and try to sell their products to the world. It was a very successful exhibition. It was actually uh, the work of uh, Victoria's uh, husband, Prince Consort, Albert, Al 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 um, and it was extraordinarily well attended. Uh, Paxton designed the Crystal Palace. So if we go to the next slide, it gives you some idea of the enormity of the structure. Big, huge glass house. Right. Also in the 19th century, Charles Darwin. I mean, he was the one who really uh, undermined the Nicene Creed. It's quite controversial. The next slide. There's a lot of mockery uh, about Darwin and his theory of evolution. Um, I put a couple of uh, things in here. Kind of fun. Um, Samuel Wilberforce was a uh, cleric uh, who went around England and preached against evolution, uh, mocking, they did a lot of mocking of uh, Darwin. At the end of their lives, they were good friends because they had one thing in common. They both, both uh, were great fighters against slavery. They, they thought it was a foreign institution. And so they became actually. United and friendly with that issue. Another slide on the time. 
But other, other inventions, uh, maybe this is the timely one of uh, vaccination. Um, you can go ahead and, uh, and you can see even then vaccination is controversial. Um, a lot of people are going ahead and against it. Other uh, aspects of the 19th century, other inventions of the 19th century, Louis Pasteur and the germ theory. Um, you can Mendel. So we have genetics, uh, discovery of chromosome, chromosomes and sexual reproduction, end of the 19th, toward the end of the 19th century. Um, and then I begin my talk about the orchid. So, uh, although the Spaniards and, and other uh, European interests were initially after gold and other uh, resources, in the Victorian period, uh, there was a period of an orchid frenzy in which tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of plants were being brought into England each year and auctioned off and grown by the enormous uh, craze for orchids. So these are some auction catalogs that give you some idea of the uh, volume of orchids. So this, uh, uh, the first one has uh, 8,000 Adonagos crystals that are going to be auctioned. And the next one has 10,000 Adonagos crystals. And this one, 15,000 15, Adonagos crystals. And the last one, 12,000 Adonagos crystals. So it gives you some idea of the huge number of plants. And out of those, of course, the very best are selected for what became the genetics of today's uh, uh, This is the uh, 1904 Tempestion. This is a, uh, an exhibit by Sir George Walford. Um, the story is that these plants were, were grown in his estate. And for three years before this exhibition, his grower, H.G. Alexander, actually ended up uh, cutting all the spikes so they could build as much strength in the plants as possible. And then these plants were actually taken to London on his private, uh, in his private rail car and staged. So the Temple Show uh, actually it is now the Chelsea Flower Show. It was the foundation of the Chelsea Flower Show, which is still going on today. Um, and H.G. Alexander, of course, uh, who uh, Holford eventually uh, gifted his plants, uh, is well known for creating the most important breeding of Cymbidium, the Petroboy plant. Cymbidium uh, Alexander variety Western, which has an FCC from the RHS, and it's in the background of a, of a large number of today's best Cymbidium. Another man of great importance was a Belgian grower uh, who had nurseries in Ghent. Um, and he introduced the first intergeneric of the Don Gossip in at the Temple Show. Uh, it was called Ranti uh, Oda Bostikia because it was a combination of what was then a Don Gossip, um, Nobile, by uh, that little uh, red flower in the right hand corner, uh, which is Copliota variety nose. Copliota nose the ants. And there's actually one of those uh, copioda mensiana on the table, planted. There's actually two plants of copioda mensiana. It's a, a plant that grows in Peru and Ecuador. And it's, uh, it contributes to bright red color. And it also shows how, um, how a male parent like copioda mensiana can introduce color without reducing the size of the flower on the larger species. And, uh, there weren't any Udantio uh, or uh, around, uh, so uh, I remade the cross probably, it was probably about 15 or 20 years ago, just out of curiosity to see what they like. And, and I still have these plants going today. They're quite pleasant. Other, other discoveries, 1905, Old Bernard uh, uh, published his work on on symbiotic funguses and their importance in the germination of orchids. You know, the story goes that he was walking through a forest, tripped over a log, rolled over, and he saw a relationship between germinating orchids and fungus. So um, I put this slide in because 
by 1910, at least in a Donna Watson reading, they had already made tremendous advances. I don't think we're, we're much better off today than, than this plant shows. Um, but it also demonstrates how they actually uh, captured the image of the these orchids. They painted watercolors uh, that were rendered from the actual flowers to all of those gorgeous plants that they had. And a lot of these watercolors are still around today. Uh, and, uh, they're a great record for what was going on in those first 30, 40 years of hybridizing. Termination of orchids at that time. Uh, required uh, the, the symbiont, the fungal relationship with the embryos. Uh, it was done on substrates that were kept at high humidity, and they actually became quite successful. Uh, companies like Charles Wolf and Saunders became quite successful in germinating orchids using this method. Um, and then uh, this American scientist, Louis Hudson, actually came up with what became known as the A symbiotic method. We found that if you sterilize the embryos, put them on sterile media that had sugar, um, as well as nutrients that you could germinate organs. So he was the one that showed that the main purpose of the fungus was to supply this little embryo, virtually no carbohydrate at all, for the initial sugars that they needed to uh, get their lifestyle. And that could be done in the sterile media. Uh, by just substituting the All right, um, I'll move along to uh, Don and myself and what we do. Um, this is the greenhouse we built at our house in Berkeley. Uh, we built this in uh, 79 when we first moved into the house, uh, much to the chagrin of the neighbors. Um, our neighbor had a big pine tree along the uh, west side of the greenhouse, and uh, it died shortly after we built the greenhouse, so we didn't have too much trouble with it. Mysterious. Uh, <laughs> so, um, for a while, we grew uh, out in uh, San Francisco, which are, which are greenhouses actually in Daly City with uh, several people from the society here. And we got kicked out of there. Uh, we uh, moved and took up space in Pacifica, California at Sheldon's on Mercy. Uh, and this gives you an idea of the climate of Pacific Death and why it's such an ideal place to grow cool, high elevation and in okay. um, So, this is a, a, a conflation of a um, couple of satellite images at the top of uh, Pacifica. Um, I, I don't have a laser pointer, and I could probably point out where, where we are with a laser pointer. So, it's, uh, it's uh, well, there you go. Continue. Now to the left. My, yeah, yeah, you're on the left. Very good. <laughs> back, back where you were. Okay. That little hill, that little hilly area, right? Yeah, that's where, that's where these green, you're right there. And that's where these green houses are. And uh, initially, we uh, uh, were in this lowest greenhouse to the left, these uh, two long twin greenhouses. Uh, when we moved into them, they had uh, mostly missing glass in this beautiful place. And, um, and there was a fox living in them uh, because they had been unoccupied for a long time. These were the Adana Glossom houses uh, of, the, of the nursery that was originally there. Uh, and eventually, we had the luxury of moving up to this greenhouse on the right, which was a greenhouse that uh, Tom Felipe had. But the nursery originally was called Dalmar Gardens, and it was started by a, a very famous uh, phalaenopsis hybrid, Herb Hager. So, um, one of the humorous things about being on this, uh, in this area is the, uh, the abundance, the beautiful forest that surrounds us, and people coming in and thinking that that's a nice native forest and, and how pristine and what a nice wilderness it is. Well, this is that area in 1949 uh, when that first uh, pair of greenhouses was going up. Um, this was very good, basically. Uh, I have more slides, and uh, there was virtually no, no forest there. Certainly, none of the Monterey cypress which are uh, uh, now on the site. This is a view of uh, the big greenhouse, um, as well as uh, a raven that shows up quite often and a buzzard. Uh, that's Edgar, um, and he has a mate named uh, Benoit. 
and uh, they've been hanging around the greenhouse for uh, quite a long time. Um, can move to another slide here. This is an outdoor area we built. Now we built the benches out here. Um, and a lot of the orchids uh, that John grows uh, are actually outdoors all, all the year long. Um, this is a flower in Poxidius. Uh, John probably has the largest collection of positive toxins in the United States. We've got a mixed uh, slide here, and this one plays. It just has a little pen around. It, uh, we were having a tremendous problem. Uh, we grew these plants, uh, John grew these plants magnificently for many years, and then they all started coming down here very quickly. And uh, we eventually sent out and had the water uh, quality for Pacific tested. And it came out with uh, 33 parts per million of sodium. Um, now, sodium is not found by itself. It's found associated with corn, with sodium corn, table salt. So we had 33 parts per million of sodium. We had 66 parts per million of sodium. Corn. Um, and that was uh, devastating to the orchids. So at that point, uh, we actually built a reverse osmosis system. And now, uh, you know, uh, what are the most delivered? And John, by the way, contributed to uh, virtually a division of each one of those plants back to Columbia for reintroduction of species on some parts of Columbia. Um, this is the Monsterville area. Uh, it would be nice to show it in the left hand, the left hand side is the Monsterville The right hand side is, is, is the brilliant part of the greenhouse directly. Awesome. Um, these are an addition, these are made with bicycle wheels. Um, so um, these all spin and rotate, but they were fairly easy to build because the bicycle wheels became the frames for these. Um, Dexter Hodes, who's also a member of the society, has been uh, copying these and building them for other people. So uh, they're quite, uh, quite convenient. And there's some fogging machines here, and this is the area that John grows. Dracula is in. In the back, you can see the storage tanks for the water and water. So just a few pictures of some of John Lawson's and some Mazdevillias. Um, this is uh, Mazdevillia Jaime Posada, um, which John hybridized, um, and some others. I won't make the slides. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> uh, a couple more. Uh, one of the problems with the monster is why uh, we actually pulled about half of the slides out of this section is because they're almost impossible to photograph. And we've had professional photographers at the greenhouse with their multi thousand dollar cameras, we've had color cards and calibrating with computers. Um, and it's just almost impossible to get a good color photograph. Um, these are the Draculas. Um, this is a pattern of John's. Um, it's done a lot of breeding uh, with Vampira, which is one of the most uh, impressive of all the Draculas. Um, this is a typical color form of Corona. And, and what follows are uh, what can be done uh, when you find a very rare color form of Corona. So this was a Outline the form found in Columbia and uh, John's work with it. Again, and uh, he, he read it back to a cross that was made with the Alba and the Mount Alba, and then from that was able to recover additional Mount Alba crumbs. Uh, so, you know, you can, you can, this is the kind of reading that takes, you know, this is eight years, 10 years of reading. It's a rewarding a fun thing to do. All right, um, for another one. Now, this is, I think, an interesting story. Uh, these were the benches, the wood from the benches that were in the lower greenhouses when we were growing down there. John made a cross, a Dracula cross, named, eventually named Raven, uh, 
which was uh, a vampire by Rosie, I think about. And uh, I guess the seed pod split before we had a chance to harvest it. Uh, Mastabilia and Dracula seed pods take about four months. Um, and so it's a, it's a dicey thing to time plucking the seed pod and selling it. So some of the seed ended up on the bench benches. Um, the benches were wood and they had funguses because they were being, they were being decayed. And so these were ravens that were actually growing on the bench. Uh, they just germinated in situ. Okay. And uh, John took them off the bench, bottomed them up. Here they are. And uh, the first thing we began to notice about them was uh, they were exceptionally vigorous and they had virtually no markings of the leaves, which is a typical thing to do with uh, tractor. Um, simultaneously, you would sell them a seed and we were growing it in, in vitro, we were in vitro in the last. Uh, they were far behind these plants in terms of their, 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 their state of their development. Um, so this was the first bloom seedling. Um, so the cross became raven, and it, it was named after Atollus, the raven, and the north is uh, probably the best known. Um, at least it was then. John's kind of make more ravens than the sick cross ravens. It's really an incredible big flower. Wow. Another Dracula. Oh, geez, uh, all right. um, John also does touch with some eyes. He works in collaboration with uh, Tom Perdini on some classes uh, with his friends for years. So, this is the, uh, the rack at home showing um, some of the cut with some eyes. I think the, the major contribution John made was getting these uh, white and purple uh, combinations because they have, uh, haven't been seen with really anything like Actual plants that we have. Right. So I'll talk about it on the um, in San Francisco, uh, probably 1982, something like that. Um, 85. Oh, this is 85. But I first heard Robert Duggar, who was a, a component of the Dunning Blossoms, who lived in San Diego, in the San Diego area, give a talk on the Dunning And he and I became fairly close friends, and I started buying classes from him, and that's really the origin of many of the plants that I grow today. Right here, in this very, very place. All right. So I thought I'd show some of Don Blossoms. This is a, a foundation species, so to say. This is Don Blossom of Crystal. Um, a Don Blossom, uh, toothed tongue, Odon Blossom. Tooth tongue and crisp on wavy edges, crisp edges. Um, these are others. You can just go through these fairly quickly. Right? This is another a great species, Nobile. It's got a, a very dense white color to it. So when you lay color on top of Nobile, it, it acts as a reflector. You actually get more intense colors. So it's a very, very nice thing to read. Another Nobile is the next slide. Um, this is from a sibling population. That I did from plants from Juan Felipe Posadas University in Colombia. And Nobile uh, contributes these kinds of great black margins to the uh, process. Uh, it really sets these flowers back. This is a cross made by Tim Bryden, also a member of the San Francisco Orchid Society, and a long, long time friend. I guess some other slides. This is from an Australian breeder. This is the kind of work that was being done at the Eric Young Foundation, uh, which are um, albus, in which all of, none of the uh, anthocyanin or purple pigments exist. Uh, this is my own cross, but it was done in plants that were bred at the Eric Young Foundation in New Zealand by a man who found the moon. Um, this is also my cross, but once again, Using those those same albinistic uh, plants, I, I named it Carrot because um, Eric Young, who established the foundation, was actually the owner of virtually all of the jewelry stores in Jersey. Mm -hmm. And Jersey is a, a, a duty free area for the uh, for Europeans and for the English, so they go there to buy jewelry, and pay taxes, and uh, 
they would run from one store to the other trying to get the best price for China, not realizing that they're from home all of so it's virtually all of so it would be better at the property. Um, so I talked about Tokyo and Louisiana and that first intergeneric hybrid. When you throw this little species, which is you know inch in, in size, uh, onto standard odontic glass lenses, some really incredible things happen. So you just go through the rest of these slides. First of all, you get reds. Um, you get uh, coloring pattern. This is one of the foundation plants we breed with red originally in the nineteen. 50s by Charles Wood. Um, so all of these have shall be influences what, what Copio and Louisiana can do. It's a really beautiful group of orchids, and I wish more people grew it, but one of the problems is where you get them. I mean, there are no commercial. This was a class I made with uh, I gave Tom Perdidi of uh, Home Gate Orchids a class, and this is one of the plants he grew in it. So it's just a an axiom of growing organs is the one you give away turns out to be the, the best. Uh, Tom produces sweet. This is a, a kind of a new line that I started. Uh, so there's several types of breeding. I mean, you can breed primary crosses, you know, one species with another. You can breed line breeding. You can breed you know, when I say line breeding, things that have 10, 11, 12 generations, and you're just continuing to breed over and over again, maybe the big chapters and the big cities and the big bosses. And then there are our, our new lines, I'm starting out with species that have never been used before, just to see where they go. And this is one of those bosses. I mean, Prince Fulton, who was a character in the class short in this. And uh, uh, some nice things coming out, and it has some real advantages in being able to be maritone and, and go on in long plants. But anyway, this is the most enjoyable breeding, but it also has the highest casualty rates. So the fortunate thing about being uh, in Pacifica on the top of a, a hillside is that I can dump all the stuff that doesn't look for down the side of the hillside. Whether they're seeded blooms, sort of a, a way to hide the, the sins of my past. Um, once I had a friend, actually Terry Root was there from the Orchid Zone. I said, Terry, why don't you see where I'm putting most of the stuff in the blooms? And I said, this, here's my, here's my, my, my hill. And he said, oh, I've got a gulch. So <laughs> apparently it's not an original idea. Okay. Uh, another new line, um, once again, looking for warmth columns. This is a flower that cuts on the stem and continues to bloom on the stem and lasts for um, uh, several months. So this is uh, Don Diodo Nova, uh, pretty extraordinary change from the species. Uh, more Nova crosses. So once again, just so. Um, well, this is a, a little bit of a departure. Um, well, let's go ahead. Um, so I began, first of all, John and I do our own uh, plastic, we do our own uh, propagation. Uh, and I began treating plants to the alkaloid that allows you to double their chromosome numbers. You double their chromosome numbers, they get fatter, they get thicker. Uh, colors get brighter, and uh, I began using this uh, this alkaloid colchicine, and uh, this is a picture of a cell uh, dividing, which shows you the chromosomes, which are, 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 are red bands there, being pulled apart by this com this protein called tubulin. This colchicine interferes with that process of pulling it apart. So if you expose them for a period of time typically like 10, 15 days, and then take them off of the uh, colchicine, some of them will start dividing again after being interrupted at this phase of cell division, and the chromosome numbers will double. Okay. And more recently, I switched to a less toxic material, which is actually an herbicide. Uh, and that time I taught it, herbicide is called. Uh, and I come up with a very nice and simple protocol for double chromosomes and the rhizome. Okay. So I said that John and I do our own fasting, which is a couple of examples of the 
products are put out. Uh, uh, when I take uh, plants out of the class, um, I can begin to identify which ones are likely polyploid, which ones have chromosomes not increased by uh, looking at the width and diameter of the roots. So when plants double their chromosome numbers, they get fatter and thicker. And you can see there some of these roots are uh, fatter and thicker than others. Um, actually, uh, in the case of the non-rossums, the uh, polyploids and tetraploids grow more vigorously than the diploids, which is uh, not true in those animals. And there's a species, Ali. On the left is the four end, on the right is the two end. But you can see the effects of the double chromosome numbers. Mobile uh, four end compared to the ones that we saw earlier. Uh, John, uh, you know, he's uh, doing the same thing. Uh, this is a uh, sip policy to the Michiana, and there's two end on the left. Coxinia. I remember uh, Andy Easton was another grower. Andy Easton was going through the greenhouse and he walked over to this plant and he said, Well, there's a whole new ball game. So, so it's kind of fun. Ignea for it. Uh, this is fun because it shows what PTI was doing back when it was awarded in 1999 as the tip and now you can see what the tetrapods are uh, looking like. So, yeah, big difference. So, uh, tragically, uh, taxonomy is uh, changing, at least from my viewpoint, it's a, it's a tragedy. Uh, the Donoglossal uh, no longer officially exists according to Q. Uh, they have conflated Donoglossal and one city, and they say that they are. Uh, too close genetically when you're looking at uh, DNA to differentiate them as a separate gene sets. So, um, following that line, uh, actually, uh, Adana Glossons and Oncidians uh, differ more than human beings do from chimpanzees. <laughs> so, um, I look at the uh, registration records to learn things about how things read. Which plants like to be males, which like to be females. And uh, so those early records are very important to me. And, and now that they've uh, confused them, uh, they're becoming uh, less and less uh, worthwhile. It's happening to cavities, my casts, I think, uh, bandas. Bandas. Lelias. Lelias. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, you know. Um, I can say that I do not have any chimpanzees in my family tree that I know of. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is my little um, parody on the RHS community that made that decision. You have to remember the artwork, what the real horticultural Well, I won't go too much into what my opinion of politics and uh, working uh, organizations are, but the Royal Horticultural Society is. Uh, Definitely a collection of sycophants. Uh, uh, you know, and, and their main goal is to try to find people who have deep pockets and put them on committees and things so that they can. They have to justify their existence. Yeah, whatever. At any rate, uh, they just had another meeting in the ORAP committee in which they substantiated the earlier inflation. Okay. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, next slide, too. Uh, the American Orchid Society. Endorse uh, the uh, change. Uh, Pete Furness, uh, Robert Griesbach, and uh, the president, uh, easy name to forget, um, actually uh, uh, went in on as, as the AOS. Um, and you know, I, my feelings are the AOS are not very friendly. Um, I think that they're an organization that has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. They you know, tried to monetize everything. Uh, Pictures of registrations and uh, has never profited them, it certainly hasn't profited uh, organ business. Uh, the other thing that's uh, competing with, with private industries is places like the big box stores like Costco, where you know tens of thousands of uh, plants. Uh, I think some, someone told me it's something like 30 million 
I've got a lot to support of it in that state. So, eighty million, no, seventy two point three of lot one point four million. Eighty. Okay. And that's split. That's just the white scale. I mean, it's the biggest money maker there is. Wow. I mean, they're beautiful orchids. I mean, I I, I would be proud of all many of those orchids, but at the same time, uh, no commercial uh, orchid breeder in the United States can possibly compete. In subsidized plants uh, um, and so this is my parody on that. It's a wonderful quote by Sam uh, Bolden. Um, it's greater than that. Give us a meeting over. All right. And uh, I'm sort of at the end of my talk here. I was uh, in, in a financial planner's office once uh, discussing uh, money, and I noticed he had this uh, picture on his wall. And, he said, I was the only person who recognized it, the Semper Augustus, which is the flower that broke the bank in Holland during the uh, tulip crisis. So I felt that, uh, you know, toward the end of this talk, uh, it was worth putting uh, Semper Augustus in. Uh, oh, so there is an international Amon Dawson Alliance. It has a website, it has a journal, it's a robust color journal. It's free. So if you want to read the journal, uh, we have 40 years of back issues that are all digitized. They're OCR, so you can do searches. And it's a very simple website. Um, and I think the next slide sort of sums up the talk. There we go. All right. Bob, when you, when you treat a plant and it gets to be a four M, does, does that get passed on to its progeny? The yes. Um, polyploids, particularly tetrapoids, breed as tetrapoids, and if they're crossed with another tetrapoid, you can continue the line. Um, but these types of tetrapoids are different than the ones that occur along the way naturally, in that in these types of tetrapoids, all of the genes, all of the alleles, are mirror images of each other. So when they produce their sex cells, their sex cells are almost identical. So they breed like a meristem. Wow. And uh, that's an advantage and a disadvantage, depending on how you think. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bob. All right. Let's try this again. So, apologies on the line to all the folks that are having trouble with the uh, the sound. It's quite good in the room, but obviously we need some kind of difference. <laughs> keep working hard. They can hear from this now, but not from the microphone. Um. So, I don't know, Lynn, are you on? Did you want to do the? Uh, Short tell. Then we can let the online people. I guess before you do that, are there any other questions for Bob? Or <laughs> uh, Could you come stand by? Oh, okay. All right. So, this is setting up. So, let's give Bob uh, a big round of applause. Thank you for coming. And Lynn is setting up. So, Lynn, you said you had very few uh, show and tell. So, many did you end up with? Jeff, I can't hear you. Are you going to do live show and tell first? No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go share screen, screen two. Looks like the puppy's grown up. Yeah. She has. She's 50 pounds. That didn't work. And she's sitting in the big chair behind you. Yes. She's 11 months old. Yeah, okay, you got your screen share. It's just you, you, all you have to do is go to slide view or the, the show view, you change the view. 
We'll be watching for another year. They take about two years to mature. Few. Dogs, not orchids. <laughs> orchids too. Okay. Yeah. Let me just... see. <laughs> Got it. Perfect. So I need to go up to the top. There, do you see the uh, first slide? Perfect. Yes. All righty. So there's not a lot in bloom right now. We have, um, uh, let me just move this over. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, we have a beautiful virtual show and tell table. Lovely orchids from 17 contributors. So that's an increase tonight. Thank you for taking the time to photograph and send me your photos. Uh, the order in which they're shown is the order in which I receive them. We'll start off with Junie Carney with her Epigenium Fargaceae, which is now Dendrobium Fargaceae. It's a miniature, as we can see from Judy's thumb in the bottom of the right-hand photo. It's an epiphytic species found in the Chinese Himalayas uh, in Thailand and Taiwan at elevations of 4,000 to 5,900 feet. So it likes cool to intermediate temperatures, ample light and good humidity, as we can see from the moss growing on Judy's cork mount. Fergaceae was the type species for epigenium, a genus of about 40 rare species characterized by a long foot or mentum under the lip. It's a really lovely flower. Judy's Phalaenopsis tanialis is a miniature fowl species found in the Northwest Himalayan region at elevations up to 8,200 feet. The fragrant flowers are about three quarters of an inch. I found an interesting factoid on this. Stig Dahlstrom discovered during his time in Bhutan that after it is pollinated, the flowers of the species turn orange. So it had been described as a separate new species called Falbraciana. But now that they've figured that out or Stig figured that out, it's now put as a synonym of uh, Fail tenialis. And our purple loving friend Andrea Lodate shows us Encyclia cordigera. This is a very dark form of the flower and Andrea says there are two large stems full of bud budding flowers. She got this purple wonder from Tiny Jungle two years ago. This is another species from southern Mexico through Central America where it's common in dry scrubby forests on both the Atlantic and Pacific sides of the dividing mountain range. And cichlids are also good windowsill candidates and they're rewarding in that they can bloom more than once a year. Almost any time from early spring to late fall, they like bright indirect light and warm to hot temperatures, considerably less water during the window. winter. Excuse me. And Andrea's Maxillaria tenuifolia. She says she's waited a long time for the flower to open up. This is a species found in Mexico and Central America where plants grow in rainforests and tropical semi-deciduous forests. They're found at lower elevations from near sea level to about 3,300 feet. So this is an intermediate grower, which likes shaded to dapple light to bloom well. The flowers are an inch to an inch and a half, uh, maybe two inches wide. They're very fragrant with the aroma of coconut or copper tone suntan lotion for those who remember that. This is a good windowsill candidate, and you just might find one from one of our vendors at Orchids in the Park, July 30th and 31st. Stuart Maneker shows us Puffinia posidarum. Puffinia is a South American genus with 16 species, which have beautiful oversized flowers on pendant inflorescences, as we can see in Stuart's photo. The species Posidarum is named after Juan Posada, a Colombian nurseryman, and is found in Colombia and Peru. It has lots of hairy appendages. If you look closely on the lip, either to attract its pollinator or to scare off predators or maybe both. Stuart grows it on his orchid wall and he mists and waters every other day. So it likes moist, warm and humid. Low light like a fowl. He bought this from Equihenra and it arrived very desiccated. It had lost many leaves, but it has recovered well in six months. And this is its first bloom with one flower, which took more than a month to open and has lasted about a week. It's really lovely flower. Stuart's Stereochylus arenaceus, 
the common name is the hedgehog stereochylus. I have no idea why, except that hedgehogs are small and cute too. This species is found in Myanmar and Thailand as a small sized, hot to worm growing epiphyte. And we can see the vandaceous monopodial growth habit. It bears pendant inflorescences with flowers which are less than half an inch, but charming with the contrasting pastel colors that we see here. This is nicely grown, Stuart. And Stuart's Phalaenopsis violacea indigo. This is a striking round flat flower with beautiful conformation and symmetry. The color, well, the color is spectacular. There's been a lot of line breeding of Phal violacea over the years. A few, a few examples on the right-hand side with the goal of achieving rounder shape and fuller segments. So you can see from 1971 to 2017 and now Stewart's um, indigo, uh, you can see the progress. This species is from very warm, hot tropics on the island of Borneo and Sumatra. It's difficult to grow successfully in a greenhouse, let alone in the home. So this is a, this is a wow, Stewart. And Stewart's Phalaenopsis cornucervi yellow. It's growing again in his orchid wall and is his first bloom. This is a species which also needs warm to hot conditions or about 66 degrees Fahrenheit or higher at night. It's from Borneo, Bangladesh and Laos where it grows on the slopes of mountains at 150 to 3000 feet of elevation in swampy forests, which is why it's growing well on Stewart's orchid wall with high humidity. It prefers dense, humid shade. And check out this next one. This is Stuart's Phalaenopsis legoensis. <laughs> Look closely. He says it's a newly discovered species from Denmark. <laughs> it's found from sea level to the highest habitable elevations. It's extremely tolerant of wider range of temperatures and humidity. While it looks best in moderately high light, it can also be found in full shade. It's clearly a great new species for windowsill growers. No water, no fertilizer, no mealybugs. This foul legoensis is awesome. <laughs> That's cute. This is Tom Pickford's Cattleya, or formerly Lelia tenebrosa, thriving in his cool greenhouse in Bolinas with 10 huge um, six inch across dark flowers on two inflorescences. The name tenebrosa means dark brown. Tom's plant won an AM quality award in 2020 with two fewer flowers than this. This is a Brazilian species, once found in a very small area in Southern Espirito Santo where plants grow on large trees in dense forests. It's believed that the limited habitat has been totally destroyed and it is now impossible to find in nature. Fortunately, it's popular in collections and perhaps it can be reintroduced into the wild one day. Tom grows it cool with winter nights into the, the low 40s and bright indirect light. This is Tom's Cattleya facellus. This is a primary hybrid of two Brazilian species, Cattleya clandii crossed with uh, Cattleya bicolor. Again, Tom grows this in his cool greenhouse with night temps into the low 40s. He was delighted to receive a 79.0 HCC on this flowering <laughs> week ago. And the judges particularly like the broad hot magenta lip. Tom grows this in a pot with porous free remaining media because Mature plants must dry out between waterings. Again, bright indirect light. This is the award photo by Ramon de los Santos. And Tom's a sickly hybrid. This is a cross made by Mary Nisbet of California orchids. And unfortunately her hybridizing log book was lost in a house fire some years ago. So she knows that one parent is a sickly cordigera, which we saw in Andrea's slide a few, few, few slides ago. But the other parent remains a mystery, unfortunately, possibly is Encyclia chiapas. This is a beautiful, very fragrant cross. And like all of the Encyclias that we find in the market, it's a great windowsill grower. Not too large, a good bloomer, long lasting flowers and fragrant. The baker notes say that Encyclia notes are, Encyclias are very fragrant when in direct sunlight. However, the fragrance rapidly disappears if the flowers are shaded, even by a passing cloud. So the pollinator must be active only in the brightest light. Andrew Smith shows us an unregistered hybrid of Jumalea arachnantha by Jumalea fragrance. Jumalea 
is an African species of about African genus, excuse me, of about 60 species found mostly on Madagascar and the Comoros Islands. All of the inflorescences carry a single fragrant white or creamy white flower. J. Fels notes say that, quote, in the late 1800s, a French company started to make a product called FAHAM, F-A-H-A-M, which consisted of leaves from Jamelia fragrance. This product was steeped in hot water to produce a tea that was very popular in its time for its unique taste and fragrance. This tea has been attributed to be an aid in digestion as well as a remedy for respiratory diseases. The leaves were also used to produce ice cream. Custards and other products much like vanilla is used today. The tea fell out of favor mainly for its very high price because of the difficulty of procuring the leaves of this species it's found a very inaccessible forest, so supplies were never great. So otherwise, I find Jumelia is very difficult to sustain in the greenhouse. But Susan Anderson grows in the same greenhouse and she has great success. So thanks for sharing this, Andrew. <clears throat> Dale Martin shows us Bulbophyllum adorable Candy Ann, uh, which was hybridized in Florida in 2007 by Bill Toms, the ultimate bulbo grower. And Bill and his wife, Doris Dukes, have won 12 of the 15 awards on it, including one they gave the clonal name of Jeff Tyler when it was awarded, <coughs> excuse me, in 2015. This is a complex hybrid and just a stunning umbel of flowers with that hinged lip to tip the pollinator up against the pollinia so they can carry it on to the next flower to pollinate it. This is Dale's Ionobulbon munificum. Ionobulbum is a genus with just two species, which were segregated from dendrobium in 1910, partly because of the fibrous leaf, leaf sheaths. But the geneticists today hate monotypic genera or with just a couple of species. So they lumped it back into dendrobium in around 2010, 100 years after it was segregated out. Whatever the name, this is a charming uh, medium-sized sympodial epiphyte from New Caledonia, where they're frequently found <clears throat> near streams on the trunks and branches of moss covered trees, shady, humid forests, shady and humid. It's a good hint. They can have up to 151 inch to one and a half inch flowers on an inflorescence. And it's interesting, the blossoms close at night and reopen in the morning. Dale's Vanda Richard Peterson is a very complex hybrid, which through this family tree still has 65% Sandriana, giving it the round flat shape we see here. And 23% Cerulea, giving the deep jewel tone and the tessellation. It's a lovely Vanda to have in any collection if you have the warm temperatures and bright light to make it thrive. Dale specializes in paths and this Paphiopetalum pelani cuntal is a beautiful example of the multifloral paths which are the product of line breeding. The gracefully twisted petals come from the Philippinense pod parent. The cross was just registered in 2015, and I'm sure we'll see lo more lovely examples out of the hybridizing community in years to come. Dale's Phalaenopsis tetraspis, horticultural form Bruniola. Horticultural form means that there's enough of them in a cluster in nature that they were given um, an official name, Bruniola. This is a very unusual and rare color form of this species. It's once, it was once endemic to Andaman and Nicobar Islands off the coast of India, but now thought to be extinct due to overcollection. Fortunately, it is a popular species in collections around the world. So there are many line bred strains in cultivation. This little gem needs hot conditions and shade and it hits the applause meter for Dale. This is beautiful. Doug Hunter shows us Catlea, previously Lelia, Zip. This was one of Fred Shaw's favorites. And it's nice to see it's still growing and thriving in Bay Area collections. This is a primary hybrid of Teneprosa by Milleri, both Brazilian beauties. <clears throat> the diminutive size, size of Milleri brings down the size of Tenebrosa, resulting in this medium sized, very floriferous Catlea hybrid. The flowers are about four inches. Doug grows it in his eight by 12 backyard intermediate greenhouse in San Francisco's Central Sunset District. And don't those colors just pop with that gorgeous 
tenebrosa-like um, striped lip. Excuse me, a little drink here. This is Doug's BLC, or now it's Green Cat Leanthe Solar Flare. Obviously a very complex hybrid with a little of all the great cats in its parentage. And it looks like the flowers are large for the size of the plant. They have beautiful yellow orange flares on the dorsal sepal and on the petals and a beautiful ruffled lip. Again, Doug Grossis in his intermediate greenhouse. Nice job. And Doug's Paphiopetalum adimic Bell Isle. And there's a nice story around this plant. Doug used to volunteer at the Bell Isle greenhouse in Detroit, Michigan. Doug says, quote, this is a division from a large plant they had. The gardener there generally, generously gave several of us volunteers these divisions. She told us she thought it was unique to their complexion collection, but I'm dubious. The greenhouse still stands despite years of neglect by a city near bankruptcy. Thanks are due to the Michigan Orchid Society volunteers who helped maintain the orchid collection there, quote. So I did a little research and this hybrid was registered in 1902, which is the same year that the Bell Isle Conservatory that you see in the picture below started construction. There are a number of um, greenhouses which care for the various plant collections. And in April, 1953, Anna Scripps Whitcomb gave her 600 orchids collection to the conservatory. And now the conservatory is named for her. It's been undergoing massive renovations this orchid has not been awarded in its 120 years in existence, but it's a stunner. Welcome back to Show and Tell Winnie Wang. Um, she shows us three beautiful noble A type of dendrobiums. The first is Dendrobium Red Emperor and the Clone Prince, which has an award of merit from the American Orchid Society. It's a beautiful noble A hybrid, taking its brilliant color and roughly lit from several of its ancestors. When he says the flowers are three inches wide, really gorgeous. The noble dendrobiums bloom with inflorescences that arise directly out of the canes, both leafless and leafy canes. They should get a fairly dry rest, uh, but not completely dry winter rest because too much water during the winter causes them to make a lot of little cakeys or plantlets from the nodes of the canes rather than saving their energy for blossoms. This is Winnie's Dendrobium C. Marion Snow King. She says the flowers are two and three quarters inches wide and they have the tiniest delicate pink blush. The clone Snow King has three AOS awards, two for culture and one for the flower quality. It's easy to see why. This is a lovely orchid. You can grow these on your windowsill with bright indirect light. Nicely grown Winnie and the plant just looks terrific. And the third of Winnie's Dendrobium noblesse is uh, this one without an ID. Winnie says she got this Dendrobium as just a little new stem without roots from a friend last spring. She was surprised to see this in bloom so soon. The plant has only one stem or cane, which is seven inches tall, but it has seven flowers on it, each wow. about two inches wide. The flowers are much smaller than the previous two noblesse that we saw. But as this plant grows up and gathers strength, the flowers are likely to get larger too. Nice job of recuperating it, Winnie. Jan and Fred Anderson show us Brassolalio Catlea Golden Tang, a complex hybrid, which was made by Roy Tokunaga of h and Orchids in Hawaii. And since it was registered in 1970, it has received numerous awards for its color, shape, and beautiful freckled lip. As you can see, the buds are red, the flowers open red, then they change to a golden yellow. Jan says she's had this plant a long time, but this is the first time she's been able to capture a photo of both colors at the same time. And this photo all gives us, also gives us a little peek at Jan and Fred's now year old, well, full greenhouse. Jan and Fred's Catlea, Catlea, rosy surprise. This hybrid is 50% Walkeriana, as we can see in the family tree, and which we can also see by the characteristic big nose for the column. We can see that Jan has this hanging high in the greenhouse for strong light, which it needs to flower this well. It has many other notable Cattleyas in its composition, which all contribute to the spectacular lip 
full flower segments and stunning color. This is Fred's Maxipedium Zero Phytocum, Oaxaca, which has a CBR AOS. Maxipedium is a monotypic genus, meaning that it is, there's only one species in the genus Maxipedium, which is surprising because the taxonomists love to lump things together these days. Maxipedium was actually removed from Cypripedium because of the different leaf and flower morphology or structure. This is a hot to worm growing species, which grows in Mexico as a lithophyte, meaning it grows on rocks or limestone outcrops. And the common name for it is the dry growing Mexipedium. In its habitat, it receives moderate water in mid spring, mid -spring time, heavy water through the summer, then a three month dry period from mid winter until spring. This charming little species is very difficult to grow successfully in cultivation. So Kudos to Fred and Jan. Jan and Fred's Maclellanara, or now it's Presidium, Yellow Star, Golden Gamble. A bit of history for those of us who love McClellan orchids in South San Francisco. The property was so valuable that in 1998, it was sold for housing and the nursery moved to Watsonville, where it was later purchased by Taisuko. Now it is called McClellan Botan Botanical slash Taisuko America. It's one of the world's largest commercial growers. So back to Jen's beautiful flower. It's a complex hybrid made in 2005. It has very crisp, well-differentiated colors and spots. Um, oncidiums and their hybrids like Brasidiums are great windowsill growers and you'll likely find some lovely ones at our Orcas in the Park later this month. Roberta Fox shows us, grows these beauties outdoors in Costa Mesa, Mesa, California. First, she shows us Dendrobium bensonii. This is a wow. Dendrobium is the second largest genus after Bulbophyllum, over 1,200 species of Dendrobium ranging through all parts of Asia and the Pacific. This is a beautiful species. It's native to Assam and Bangladesh and Myanmar at elevations for 1,500 to about 5,000 feet. This is one of the few Himalayan dendrobiums that Roberta does dry out over the winter. It goes completely deciduous, loses all of its leaves, then buds appear in early June, and that's when she starts watering. It blooms on the prior year's bare canes, and it takes about four years for an old cane to completely desiccate. So don't be in a rush to clean it up. It's best grown mounted, as Roberta has it, to accommodate the pendant growth habit. This is really beautiful. This is Roberta's Lofgrenianthus Blanche Amesii, a very charming miniature with a name that is much bigger than the plant. This is a very rare twig epiphyte from South and Southeast Brazil, where it occurs in cool, damp forests at elevations from about 3,200 to 6,500 feet. This is another monotypic genus that doesn't seem to have been lumped together yet, maybe because it is too unique. It's pendant growing, as we can see. The flowers point downward, so it's necessary to get underneath them or flip the plant over to see how beautiful they really are. Roberta grows this outdoors, so it enjoys a cool winter. Roberta's, Roberta's Lycasti tricolor. This is a double wow. Let's hear the applause. What a beautiful, beautiful display. From Costa Rica and Panama, in rainforests with high humidity at elevations ranging from 900 to 3,500 feet. This would imply that it needs intermediate to warm temperatures, but it seems to do just fine outside on Roberta's patio. Every year it's covered in flowers, almost in a ball, a true flower machine, she says. The sepals are greenish, petals and lip are pale pink. There are dark pink raspberry markings in the throat, though Roberta says three colors, is really a stretch. The flowers are about two and a half to three inches. They're waxy, they're fragrant. And this is just a gorgeous display. And Roberta's Oncidium astolabium, found in Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, possibly in Ecuador, at elevations around 4,900 feet. This is originally an odontoglossum, a warm to cool growing epiphyte. The three inch flowers are fragrant and long lived arising from the leaf sheath of a mature pseudobulb. The spike is about four feet long, 
with the lowest one foot bare, the flowers on the, are on the upper three feet with only a small amount of branching. So many of the oncidiums are yellow and brown. This is a really lovely uh, color variation with the, the deep pink in the, in the upper part of the lip. Very pretty. Susan Anderson shows us Miracillium Wenlandii, which is way more adorable in person than a photo can capture. It's a miniature species from Mexico and Guatemala, where it grows in moist wooded canyons on the Pacific slopes at elevations from 1950 to 4250 feet. Susan grows it well in her intermediate greenhouse with winter nighttime temperatures down only as low as around 58 degrees. Jay Fowles notes indicate that it is best grown mounted on tree fern, it requires shade and ample watering while growing and less after the flowering. The flowers are about one inch. Susan's Bulbophyllum fascinum, which she's had for several years, but it has never flowered. You can see it's filling a fairly large bulb pan here in her greenhouse. Just two weeks ago, she threatened it with a trip to the compost pile because it was never gonna bloom. And look what miraculously happened. A perfectly shaped two and a half inch flower, proud as all get out. This bulbo is endemic to the Philippines where it grows as an epiphyte on tree trunks in shady locations or on the rocks below them. I've read that the flower opens in the morning and closes by early afternoon, only to reopen the next day. So Susan, you'll have to keep an eye on it and uh, see if it's behaving properly. Susan got this lovely Vanda from California orchid several years ago, and the name tag has escaped the greenhouse. The sherbet colors and the little twisted petals are, are really charming, not to mention the hot red lip with all of the polka dots. Dave Hermeyer shows us Angraecum didieri. Angraecum is a genus of about 230 species spread throughout tropical Africa, the Comoros Islands, the Seychelles, the Mascarines, and also Madagascar. <clears throat> they require a wood slat basket or mount high humidity, moderate shade and ample water while in growth, unless when they're not in growth, <clears throat> but they should never be allowed to dry out for long periods. And Graycum didieri is one of the most stunning with two and a half inch pristine white flowers with a sparkling texture and a greenish spur or nectary as we see in Dave's photo. The flowers are long lasting and it can bloom, for more, it can, can bloom more than once a year. It grows at 2,500 feet, so it's happy and cool to warm conditions. Try it on your windowsill. It's a delightful orchid for any collection. Dave's Angraecum germinianum. This small species is from Madagascar in the central plateau region at elevations of 3,000 to 5,000 feet, and it grows on very humid cloud-covered slopes. Dave's is a beautifully grown, vigorous plant the single flowered inflorescences that carry a two inch fragrant jasmine scented, long lasting, non resupinate meaning that the lip is above the rest of the wax, waxy flower. It prefers a diurnal range or temperature drop of up to about 25 degrees during the winter from day to night. Water should be reduced in autumn after new growths mature and until uh, the new growth starting in the spring, then heavy water and good humidity year round. <clears throat> Dave's Rincolalia digbiana. The genus Rincolalia was created in 1918 when two species, digbiana and glauca, were removed from Brasovola because they differed significantly in their leaf and flower structure. Dig digbiana is the much more flamboyant of the two with intricate fringe all around the perimeter of the lip. It grows from Mexico into Central America on stunted trees in hot, humid lowlands near sea level. So this is a plant which wants year round water, somewhat less in winter and warm nights with a small diurnal range only up to about 12 degrees between day and night temperatures. Though those of us who grow it find it fairly adaptable to a wider range. This could be a windowsill candidate uh, if you can provide <clears throat> good humidity, maybe in a bright bathroom window. Our president, Jeff Harris, shows us Elianthus amethystinus, which he bought from Andy's orchids in 2018. No doubt Andy pointed it out and sold Jeff on a cute tigger face. 
and he's a very persuasive salesman, which I can attest to. Uh, this one came in a pot, not on a stick. Elianthus is a genus of about 116 species, which need to be kept moist at all times as they have no pseudobulbs to store moisture. And they live in moist to very wet forests as both epiphytes and as terrestrials. This species is from Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru, up to 6,500 feet, so it likes cooler temperatures. I grow it outdoors, actually. And this species can take nearly full sunlight except at midday. The plant looks like a small subrelia with a cluster of these small flowers at the apex of the inflorescence. Jeff's Mastabellia acacia. It looks like there's something really dangerous going on inside that fuzzy blood red lip. This is the Mastabellia with the largest flowers of the genus with each flower up to four inches across and six or seven inches long, including the cod eye or tails. It's dramatic, a bit smelly, fun to see in bloom. Tom Perlidi and Marnie Turkel have both uh, won awards on this species. It's a species from Colombia. Uh, it's endemic to the southern part of the Western Cordillera from 5,200 to 7,200 feet. So it is a cool grower and it requires excellent ear movement. The Baker notes on this set indicate that it needs nights averaging 53 to 55 with a diurnal range of 12 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit and, and that these temperatures represent the warmest conditions under which the species should be grown. Because of the range of habitat elevation, plants should adapt to conditions uh, six to eight degrees Fahrenheit cooler than indicated, so certainly into the 40s. I believe that both Jeff and I have lost plants that we attempted to grow too warm, and I'm looking for a plant if anybody knows a source. Deborah Vale's Qualder shows us this yellow beauty, which she would like help identifying. If anyone has any guesses, please use chat to let Deborah know what it might be. Jeffrey Doney shows us a beautifully grown Lelia purpurata, variety sanguinea, referring to the deep magenta color. This species is the national flower of Brazil. They've named dozens of variations of color and blushing and striations. It's truly a national treasure, which we enjoy here in the Bay Area as well. It grows in a narrow band for about 750 miles along the coastal plain of Brazil, usually below 600 feet of elevation, which would suggest they're warm growers, but many of us grow them successfully in quite cool conditions down into the low 40s even. And they seem to thrive as long as they have bright light and good air movement. This is really lovely, Jeffrey. And Jeffrey's Encyclia, which he purchased from California orchids in Bolinas 10 years ago. This year it had 10 spikes and a sweet fragrance. Encyclia is a genus made up of 188 species that spread through all of tropical America, including the West Indies. They grow as epiphytes, so they can be grown in cultivation, either potted or mounted. And as a whole, they do best in intermediate conditions. These are good windowsill candidates. This is my area, or now it's Bryobium hyacinthoides. There are about 370 species in the genus area, and they're infrequently cultivated orchids, though they're found across tropical Asia and out through the Pacific Islands to Fiji. This species was discovered in the early 1800s on the Malaysian Peninsula at elevations of 1,600 to 5,500 feet. So I grow it in the intermediate greenhouse. I bought it at the Sonoma show in 2015, and it puts on a floral display every late spring like this. The flowers, which are thought to resemble a hyacinth, are about three quarters of an inch. They're fragrant, maybe strangely fragrant. And my Dendrobium farmeri found in the Eastern Himalayas, Thailand, Laos, Malaysia, in evergreen lowland forests on tall trees high up over river courses at elevations of 500 to 3,200 feet as a pendulous warm growing epiphyte. The pendant inflorescences arise from the tips of old leafless canes, as you can see here. The flowers are about two inches across. The species prefers some shade and heavy watering with a short winter rest. And my Dendrobium helwigianum. This is a miniature species from Papua New Guinea where it grows on horizontal branches. 
elevations of 4,600 to 8,000 feet. So I grow it mounted on a stick in my cool greenhouse with night temperatures into the low 40s in the wintertime. Each year it puts on a display like this and the tiny flowers last for up to two months. It gets water twice a week, although much less in the winter. And I got this from Andy's Orchids at POE in 2020. And just to give Orchids in the Park one more plug, it's a great little summer show with 16 vendors, as you can see here, from around the globe, some lovely displays. This is your next great chance to add a few beauties to your collections and a few volunteer for one or more shifts. No experience needed. You'll get free admission to the event and a free lunch too. It's fun, it's easy. We'd really appreciate your help. Contact Dave Hermeyer or Google San Francisco Orchid Society. Click on events and use the volunteer sign up form at the bottom of the page. And lastly, our pet parade. Lisa Perla's gorgeous Lilac Point Balinese Kitty, eight months old, is showing off those amazing baby blue eyes among Lisa's symbidiums. It looks like she's focused on something to pounce on. Good job, she's protecting those orchids. But Lisa says she's actually hiding from the German Shepherd. Jeffrey Doney had this little wild orchid pup. On the left, you can see this little wild orchid that popped up in his backyard in the Oakland Hills. I'm guessing that it is Epipactus helleborine, which uh, I understand came in on shipments from Europe, uh, furniture shipments mostly mixed in with the Excelsior, which was used as a packing material. Jeff was checking out the orchid and his adorable puppy, Puzzle, was curious as to what he was looking at. She's a Border Collie Australian Shepherd mix and her markings look like a puzzle, hence the name. And on the right, you can see her lying on her um, cowhide rug. <laughs> That's it for tonight. Thank you to everyone who contributed photos. See you at Orchids in the Park and at the August meeting. Great job, Lynn. Thank you. Lynn, can you guys hear us in the room at all? Yes. I think the owl is working without the microphone system. So, uh, so we'll work on it for next time, but we'll try to um, finish up using the owl. So, yeah, just stay close to the owl. <laughs> All right. Faye, uh, did you have an announcement? Yeah, I wanted to make it up to all now. I wanted to make it. <laughs> I wanted to make an announcement. Uh, we are accepting pledges for the conserv Orchid Conservation Alliance, Alliance for, um, for the Dracula the Reserve. Dracula Reserve. I, um, I started uh, a pledge and then Stuart said that we should also announce whoever wanted to pledge, then we will actually pledge tonight. Whoever wants to pledge for our donation. So basically, right, this started, um, I think people that are, are on the OCA mailing list probably got this, this blast, right? That there, and, and Adam was talking about it earlier. This yes. Time, they're trying to raise like a hundred thousand dollars to buy these two plots. This, well, one of the two plots of land to get the government to um, basically not let the gold mining continue. So they're on a timeline. They've already raised sixty thousand on their own. So they're they're trying to like move quickly. They've made uh, appeals to societies. So she, Mary came to our board meeting. The board has put up. Or over 2,500, as, as Adam said. So we're doing all we can so that after Orchids in the Park, end of July, at the August board meeting, we're planning to match like all the, you know, all the money we get. So that's what Adam was saying. We're trying to get to 10,000 with the society matching up to half of that, right? up to 5,000. So that's the appeal. Every little bit helps, you know. Yeah. Um, so whatever you can, you know, you can do it on our website, you can do it here at the meeting, um, you can 
help out with that, or um, you know, we'll have a booth. Mary will have an OCA booth at the Orchardton Park. Um, uh, for if uh, if if you donate online, just put uh, SFOS match in the comments box, and it, that that uh, we'll be able to record the uh, the match. Right, and Roberta is the. Uh, are you the treasurer or the, or the webmaster? <laughs> no, I actually, actually, I'm I'm the membership, uh, the membership uh, person. For OCA, right? Yeah. So thank you for all you do, uh, Roberta. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. I know we went through announcements at the beginning. Where we have some um, beautiful orchids on the actually on the opportunity table that I took pictures of and was going to try to share with folks on Zoom as well as the uh, what we have in the room here on the uh, on the uh, show and tell table. Uh, we have a few more. So I'm going to see if I can do this on the Zoom while we show people in the room what's in the room here. So starting on the far right there is the, let's see if I can technically figure this out. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Give me one second. Bear with me. Yes. Okay. So these are now. Uh, plants that Bob brought in for the um, opportunity table. I can do them one by one. Sorry. I'm trying to do it more efficiently. Let's try to copy the screen. Okay, you can see that, right? Uh huh. This is for experiment. That's Mazdavelia Kingstar. This is that other one was Wilsonara Firecracker Sangria. There's other Odons and Coxinias they brought in here. Some nice Vichianas and, and uh, hybrid. That's the Gypsy Rhapsody versus Vichiana by Vichiana Goliath. Um, there's just, I think this is no Don, oh, Cochleota, Rose Liana, which was the Pacifica clone, which is the one that Bob in his talk, if you could hear him, he was talking about what happens when you take this little red, cool growing. Cochleota and cross it with O-dots, what, what you get. Remember that part where you got all the red and you know, other forms? This is the one that's over on the table and doing over there. We're selling uh, lots of raffle tickets in the room, by the way. And we're using the square system as well. So we're doing lots of practice. Also over on the table is some other nice Mazdavellias. This is Bay Breeze. Um, Mazdavelia, John Leathers, Carlotta by Bay Breeze. Um, uh, this is often seen in the display case, Mazdavelia. Chaplitsonii, one of the ripoff clones of Mazdavelia chaparensis, uh, or Ignea, this beautiful little um, Cartea Perinopsis. Anyway, can you guys see all these? Is this good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this had a bunch of tags. Bob Slow said, down. Bob said this was a new clone. One of the ones that didn't throw down this hillside. Um, 
And then over on the table, this is where I was starting on the far right, uh, Andrea Wadet. Um, I know I'm, I always slaughter your name. How do you really say it? It's actually Wadati. Wadati. Andrea or Andrea? But Andrea is fine. Andrea yeah, Wadati. You like keep slaughtering your name. So she had this in as an oncidium in Cicliar Cordigera. 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 Um, and then over here we have Tom Merrick's uh, is half pelosum. Half your pedum. This is cake plums, prosecchia, abbreviata. Oh, I moved from encyclia. Um, it's prosecchia, sorry. Um, this one is Tom's um, frag along the pole. Oh. Um, this is Tom's um, frag Hertzii. And this one is Tom's um, frag Pierce. Oh. This nice. Uh, oh. yeah. All right, okay, I need some help. This is the this is the oncidium. The oncidium is a little yellow one. Yeah, I'll pull it up. I think I've seen this growing on trees, like uh, like in the in the. Do you remember when we went? <laughs> well, it grows. It grows from Mexico down to Peru, but uh, no, Peru. excuse me, the puma is from Brazil. Oh, okay. Anyway, we saw it on a, on a trail in Ecuador. Oh, um, well, they could have put it there. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is where they, I think they collected them from. From Brazil, and then. K also has two chromanians, right? This lighter one and the darker yellow one. Also from Brazil. These are all from Brazil, says. And these are Chromania or Solova and Silvana. And then this is the Greater Mesa. Greater Mesa, yeah. And then since from yes, Africa. There's also one that I didn't take pictures of. This is a this year's pick? No. 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 Oh. Oh right. Okay, yeah, I didn't get to put the name back on it. And, and so tell us who it is, what it is, and it's uh, Bill, it's Inara, it's, it's um, it used to be in Sickly of Marii, now they're for Sick and Marii, but I know the root taxonomist. Um, and that's a very good cross. If you have a chance to pick one up, do it because there's been multiple awards in the last three years, one of the most awarded new cultivars. Uh, probably going to get an AQ, good for green and look green with purple. Lip. Breeding in the Cattleya Alliance, fast grower, compact, very good plant for, for breeders That's and other growers. Uh, Unara, Key Lime Star, now for a second year, Cattleya. You missed the other oh. That's Dracula Deltoides. I brought in this. Uh, I got this from John Leathers actually. This is a Dendrobium alantirosium, the back of Northern. And it's a really prolific <laughs> bloomer. And I actually had two of these, and I gave one to each. So maybe one day, so one pairs of time. <laughs> But 
Okay, see that? It's a pretty nice bottom. This is also kind of a key. This is an ornithocephalus floresii. Okay, which one did I miss? So before we hang up, uh, and we'll finish the raffle in the room. Uh, folks online that want uh, are interested in the raffle for the Sunset Valley Orchid gift certificates, uh, please write your name in the chat. Then you're interested, like say yes or something like that, so I can do recording and we'll capture that and we'll follow up uh, like probably tomorrow or the yeah. next day if we don't get to. Yeah. And let you know who won by email. We have a random number generator process, so we take everyone and do it that way. One person in the room here can also in one. Um, also in the announcements, I mentioned pre-orders, so or Adam did. So there, the pre-orders for orchids in the park from most of the vendors, it's near the deadline. So if you haven't looked, it's under the coupon and offers section on the membership site website. Price this weekend. What? Um, who's my next month's speaker, August 2nd, Peter, Peter Lynn. He uh, wants his orders in by July 29th so he can get them all ready to bring with him on August 2nd. Right. And uh, there's tons of postcards. We have like 5,000 postcards. Uh, so please take postcards, even more than you think you'll need, and just pop them off at cafes or people, you, businesses you know, garden centers, whatever, just spread the word. And we still are very short on volunteers for signing up on that signup.com. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do so. Because um, uh, we really do need uh, more people than we have. I, I know people will show up and sign up towards the end, but we have to we try to print out badges and be a little more organized. <laughs> and so that will help us. The last thing I want to mention is the pre sale, the online pre sale. So I'm doing the pre sale. Um, the deadline, if you want to sell plants, is this Friday or this weekend. You need to send me a list of the plants you want to sell online. They'll go on, on our website on sale on the following week, on Friday the 15th. Uh, you, I can send you instructions. You need the name and a code and the price and a picture. And, uh, and so and we'll send out an email announcement to all the membership first. And then we're going to start advertising on Facebook and with our bigger list. That we, we have like 5,000 names that we email for POE advertising. And the last year or so, we've made a lot of money on the pre-sales, uh, and then people pick them up at Orchids in the Park. And then obviously you can do the same, send everything in without the pictures, and uh, Eugene and Faye are handling the, um, the live <laughs> uh, sale. Uh, they're chairing that, so if you want to help out, if you're going to sell, one of the deals is you have to put in at least a shift, a three-hour shift at the member plant sales table to help out with selling those plants, okay? It's not just yours, but everybody's. So, and the society gets 25% of that, uh, you get 75% in the week, take out the sales tax on top of that. All right, I will stop. We will uh, take the names. Thanks for your patience, everyone. We're going to hang up right after I get all the names in the chat. And we're going to start the raffle. So thanks for your patience, everyone. <laughs>